All right, so for day two of the class, I've got a few goals here. And once again, I'm going to write some notes. And I'll put these notes into the network folder at the end of the day. You're free to write your own notes as well. We have Microsoft Word. We have Notepad. I'm just going to write some notes in Notepad. Uh, so we will do um, quick continuation. We'll do a, a little bit more of Twitter. But then the main topic today, Google+. Plus. So what I'll come back for Twitter for briefly is to look at a couple of um, useful things about Twitter. We have analytics. Well, actually, let me back up. We have TweetDeck, analytics, and ads. TweetDeck is the power user's Twitter interface. Analytics, checking stats on your account, and ads, boosting your tweets for the right audience. I said on the first day of class that social media is a lot like marketing in the real world, in that in the real world, I would put an ad in the paper or on TV or a billboard it's advertising its marketing for my business social media is the digital version of that and so we want to use it the most effective way uh, um, in this case Twitter so TweetDeck is the way that we can manage multiple accounts at once uh, we can search hashtags and monitor traffic a lot better. And we'll look at this stuff together in a moment. But TweetDeck is very, very useful for that power user's um, interface. And this is at tweetdeck.twitter.com. So we can say, use it for research and monitoring. Hashtags and trends. We talked about hashtags and trends last time. Uh, we'll look at them a little bit again today. Use it to manage multiple accounts. For most of us, perhaps, it doesn't matter the multiple accounts. For most of us, it's going to be that it's uh, I've got one account. Um, and it's my main account, and that's the one I'm trying to um, manage, uh, keep up to date, and post upon. But depending on your business, you may have more than one Twitter account, and you can manage them all from TweetDeck. At Analytics, this one's at analytics.twitter.com. Uh, look at your most popular tweets. Look at your most popular tweets. Uh, demographics. Who is interacting with your account? <coughs> And actually, there's a spot here for um, inspiration in the terms of um, trends. And lastly, for ads, um, I think this one is ads.twitter.com, or it might be business.twitter.com. We'll confirm it in a moment. where you set up ads and track their effectiveness. So
So um, on social media, we can either use these completely for free, uh, and that'll work fine, or on many of these networks, we can actually pay and reach more of an audience, especially reaching the right audience. If I've got a restaurant, I want to be able to target my tweets to those that are interested those that are foodies, those that are interested in Italian food, those that are in a certain location. If I just tweet normally, the tweet goes to all over the world, which doesn't help me if I, my business is in San Diego. So I'm able to target who can take most advantage of my tweets by ads by paying for it to go to the right people. And it can be very affordable. It can be a few dollars you know five dollars ten dollars it can be as expensive as you want or as you as you need it a hundred dollars a thousand dollars these uh, social networks will gladly take all the money you want to give them uh, so that you can advertise your content to more people and all the networks have a version of that uh, Facebook is the big one uh, there's you can also do it in Pinterest in YouTube in Twitter etc So we'll explore each of these for a moment. Then we'll get to the topic of the day of Google+. So any, any questions so far on, on these concepts? Let's go uh, check out how this actually works. So if you'd like to open up your web browser, if you have a Twitter account like we talked about last time, uh, you can go to the address tweetdeck.twitter.com. So, TweetDeck used to be an independent company that was used for managing multiple social accounts. Then the official Twitter parent company bought them, probably for millions of dollars, and integrated it into their main uh, site. So their own blurb is, Tweet Like a Pro, the most powerful Twitter tool for real-time tracking, organizing, and engagement. Reach your audiences and discover the best of Twitter. So basically, you log in. If you've got a Twitter account, you log in. It will then take you to the interface. If you don't have the Twitter account, uh, you don't really have to go through much trouble at the moment of signing up. Uh, like when we talked about it last week, if you had an account, you could sign in. If not, you can just kind of follow along and then do it at your own pace. But I'm going to log in with an account just to show you what it looks like. Okay, so when you log in, it looks uh, kind of overwhelming. You have several columns, uh, which are all customizable on the left panel. There's also uh, on the there's a left column perhaps that you can expand. I'm gonna open it up that way. I'm currently logged in with a certain account. I can add more accounts. I have these main columns, and I can add more columns. So here's the columns. Home, notifications, messages, activity. There's a few that are built in as soon as you uh, log in. But on this home column, then, this is the, the live Twitter stream of the accounts that you're following. So all the accounts that I'm following here, they show up. And this was tweeted a minute ago. This was eight minutes ago. Uh, 15 minutes ago, etc. So as there are new tweets from the accounts that I follow, they will show up in this column. When there are notifications, who followed you, who replied to you, those things will show up here. Who retweeted you. So in real time, it'll pop up right there telling you that. 
if there are any direct messages, there's a column for that. And then activity. So this is other activity related to your connections. Um, when you follow an account, you can keep up to date with what, with what they are doing. So here, City of Chula Vista. Uh, in this account, I'm following this account, and it then tells me that that account did that. I'm following the other account at the top, and it said that account did this. Well, all of these columns are, of course, incredibly useful, right? One is keeping track with what's going on. So right now, that one just popped up as I've been talking, so I can keep up to date with the accounts that I'm following. But the activity column is also very useful. And when we talked about last time, remember, we, we talked about the strategy of interacting with those that are being active. I talked about that if you search for and find accounts that are being active uh, in a specific topic, that would be most useful for you to uh, then follow more accounts. So I'll write in the notes here in TweetDeck. The activity column can be one of the most useful columns because it lets you find more accounts to interact with. If I'm following a particular account, over here, I'm following Brad Larick. I'm following that account for a reason. It relates to my business. It um, has um, something of use to me that I'm following it. It would then be important for me to know, well, who is that account replying to, or favoriting, or what are they following? So it's like a friends of a friend sort of thing. Friend of a friend. Discover more connections. I can create more columns as well. Um, over here, I can add a column. For example, I want to monitor a hashtag or a keyword. So I can click Add Column, and it says, what, what kind of uh, column do you want to create? These are the common ones at the top. For example, search and such. Um, maybe I want to create a column only monitoring my followers, who is following me. Uh, maybe I want to create a column only that is um, of those that are mentioning me. Though that information right now kind of gets jumbled together a little bit all in notifications. But if I want a column only of a particular one of these, I can do that. But here's the, the most useful one under search. If I go to search up on here, search Twitter. So last time I was giving the example of cookies. So if I search for a keyword cookies, it might pop up with suggestions, with accounts, or the hashtag. I'm going to search just for cookies. Creates a new column. So here then in real time will be another um, column that uh, is global and will be populating with that keyword as more of those appear. So here I'm just putting a couple of things here. Um, in this column of uh, cookies, things are updating. I put a column here for Comic-Con. San Diego Comic-Con is coming up soon. So these are going to be populating. See here, it could, uh, it could be a lot of content that is kind of zooming by. So you'll be able to stop the stream just by scrolling down, and then it'll pause. So 
So the point of this is I've got a business, I've got a, uh, a restaurant. Uh, I could put in various keywords to, to pop up uh, regarding uh, dinner or brunch or, uh, you know, family-friendly food. I could have various columns of these various um, keywords that will then populate in, the, uh, in these columns where I can then uh, start to reply to people, like, remember all of these actions that we talked about. Right, we talked about the various actions you want to uh, like something, retweet it, reply to it to get their attention that you exist, uh, to then get results. <clears throat> so any questions on TweetDeck? It's a kind of complicated looking interface, but as you use it, uh, it, it should make sense, and the big idea is that it um, lets you monitor things at a glance. So, any questions on that? Okay, so the other thing we can look at then is analytics. If you open, um, if you go to the address analytics.twitter.com, The first time that you go to the address, perhaps it asks you for a little bit of setup. Uh, but then here, after you've got it set up, uh, it pops up here to give you various info. So on this example account here, uh, you get some quick info right here, profile visits, followers, etc. Tweet impressions. Remember, we talked about impressions versus conversions. I'll mention that briefly again here. Impressions, conversions. How often people see your content. And conversions, how often people interact with your content. So oftentimes impressions are very high. A lot of people see uh, my content, but perhaps conversions are not on par. I don't have people replying or following as as much as impressions and that's normal just like that ad in the paper a lot of people might see it but perhaps a lot of people don't call don't follow through in the ad. Okay, so this analytics is like this. It'll tell you your stats on a month-by-month -month basis, and um, it'll give you how many followers you've got or how many followers you've lost and that sort of thing. So this is going to show you how effective you're being. Um, and in this example account, I haven't really used it in a while, so the stats are a little lacking. That's the, that's the point of this also that on a long-term basis it'll show you your uh, your effectiveness in terms of if you're active on social media that's part of the th that's part of even the basics of how you get more followers how you get activity how you get likes how you get visibility so simply being active is one of the things that I can say about how do you use social media at the very least be active uh, don't let it lie fallow for weeks or months if you created an account but haven't used it in months well it's not doing you any good uh, you should be active in any of these accounts if you want any sort of result from these other screens at the top again we can see okay tweets uh, in the last 28 days or if you have a longer time period here this is what was happening on a day-by-day -day basis um, these particular days had the most activity, the most impressions. People looked at your account, looked at your tweets, etc. In, in this time period. Uh, scrolling down, it would tell you the exact details and 
you can check what were the top tweets of that time and replies and such. Your audience, as you use these accounts, as you get followers, as you interact, this will become more accurate in terms of it, it telling you your connections have, a, uh, have an affinity towards these topics. Tech news. Well, this account is related to technology, computers, and such, so I am reaching that audience. Some of these are, are interesting, though, like comedy. I guess some of the tweets we do are funny sometimes. Uh, travel and news, books, technology again, right there. Tech news and technology. In general here, then, the genders and other stats. So how does it know this? As I said last time, uh, uh, millions of people use these networks, and we give away so much information uh, about what are we uh, having to eat today, what are we doing today, where am I traveling? So all of that information is being collected by all of these networks. And I said from the consumer side of it, uh, I think it's too intrusive, it knows too much about me. But from the business side, I think it's a very powerful and useful thing in that I know I, the audience I'm trying to reach because they tell me what they're about, and then I'm able to create content to reach that audience. Under events, this one's interesting. Uh, this is what I was saying earlier about inspiration. So uh, this is going to tell me some events, overviews, etc. Uh, here's some holidays that are coming up. So obviously 4th of July is coming up, and it's relevant uh, to these regions, the U.S. obviously, many parts of uh, the Americas, even over in, in Europe a little bit, even in Japan, apparently. So um, knowing that this is an event that's coming up, I can uh, create a Twitter campaign to capitalize on that. Now, campaign is the secret code word for paying, or um, you know, paying to, to market and to reach an audience, which I'll cover that in a moment. But what else? So it says here, Comic-Con is coming up. Um, how many tweets on average are, are, are created about that? How many impressions? How much reach? Over here, the fireworks festival in Japan. Uh, between these days. So this is telling me between these days it might be advantageous to you if it makes sense to tweet about this topic or this topic or this topic within these days. You might reach, you might have the, these numbers regarding impressions and such um, to try to reach that audience. Let's see what else. Tanabata holiday, back to school, BET awards, Shark Week, the SBs, Lollapalooza. So here's all of these events that are happening soon. Go look at sports. So the PGA tournament is going to start on the 25th. Over here, might tell you the audiences as well. The Royal Ascot in the UK. You can go in and uh, look at more detail. Demographics, um, popular tweets on a topic, its reach. The point of that, again, is for me to identify a topic, identify influencers. Um, if I go look at who were the people replying, who were the people liking, who were the people retweeting on that account, I might then find an audience that is relevant to my account. Movies, recurring trends and such. So a lot of information here. Recurring trends, these are these hashtags that people use uh, hashtag FBF, that's Flashback Friday. So what is that? You can click on that, it'll give you the details, uh, what's popular, etc. Thankful Thursday. So here are ideas of uh, Thursdays. I could create this kind of content. Music Monday. Uh, maybe I'm Victor's Bakery and I'm selling cookies and cupcakes and all of that, but what if 
I jazz things up, I change things up a little bit by jumping onto a, a popular <coughs> hashtag and trying to figure out how can I bend it to, to my purpose. Uh, Music Monday, I could put, uh, you know, a, um, a photo uh, of a fun song and then how does it relate to uh, my, rest, uh, my restaurant, my bakery, etc. What else? Videos and such. Okay, so this is the analytics screen. Um, it can be very powerful, especially as you start using it, because it'll give you then the, the data <coughs> about how effective you are in the account. Any questions on uh, analytics, Twitter analytics? Okay, the third item uh, on uh, Twitter. Uh, we can go look at the ads system, and let me just confirm the address on that one. I think it's ads <coughs> on Twitter. Yeah, it is there. So uh, I'm not going to go very far in this one, but ads.twitter. <coughs> this is welcome to Twitter ads. Hundreds of millions of people turn to Twitter to discover what's happening in the world. Twitter ads can help you connect with this audience and get meaningful results. Now, uh, I'm not going to fully set it up because it's going to ask a little bit of info. Um, but yes, this is going to be their system of uh, paying to reach an audience. Um, I, I, I say early on in these classes, yes, uh, you can use them for free or you can pay. So all social networks. are free to set up and to use, but oftentimes you get better results when you pay. It stands to reason just like in the real world. I'm not going to expect very good business if I'm just waiting for someone to wander in front of my restaurant and walk in. I should be putting an ad in the paper or on TV or on the radio or paying someone to stand in the corner flipping that sign pointing to my front door. Uh, minimum wage at least, I hope. <laughs> and so uh, it's the same thing in the digital world. Um, you should shake the notion or the indignation about having to pay for any of this. It is very valuable, and as I've said before, um, it, it does work. Um, actually, I haven't said before. I realized something at the end of the day last week. I realized we started our class, we got into it right away. And that's because um, last Friday was the fourth class that I had taught that week for the first day. So they were all kind of jumbling together. I forgot to e even simply introduce myself last Friday, we just got right into it, didn't we, right? I realized that at the end of the day, like, oh, I just went a whole week, I taught four classes, but on one class I didn't even kind of introduce myself. Let me just back up very briefly on that, in, in that, well, okay, I, I've taught these classes for this college, um, for San Diego City College, I've taught classes here for 10 years. I've taught classes at Southwestern College for 11 years. I've taught all of these concepts of social media, of web design, of marketing, of programming for 10 years. Uh, before all of that, after I got my degree, I started as a freelance web designer. I started as a social media marketer. I'm still in that. I, I still teach and I'm still in a company where we do this. All of this that I'm talking about in these classes, we do this for real clients. Uh, we set up social media accounts. We set up editorial calendars. <clears throat> we, we do uh, video tweets, we create YouTube videos, we do all of this. So that's the main thing that I wanted to say last time, that all of the stuff that I'm talking about would be things that we would do in my company for real clients. And so when I deal with real clients, we tell them early on, okay, we're going to set up all your accounts and we're going to help you as much as possible to reach your audience. But there will be a wall that you hit at some point where what you're doing for free doesn't quite work anymore. So the next level to improve your company's reach is to go through the ad system of the networks.
paying some amount of money, and it can be very, very affordable. It can be the cost of a latte or two. You can start to reach an audience, the right audience, that is most interested in your content. Like I said last time, if I've got a restaurant, I want to put a TV commercial. Am I going to, am I going to put the, uh, you know, my food-related commercial onto a, a sports channel versus a food channel? Probably the food channel, where people are already susceptible to food and to eating. They're watching a food channel. They see my restaurant. They might then come to my restaurant. As opposed to a sports channel, maybe they're not in that mindset. They're, they want to watch sports. They're not looking at you know, food, let's say. In the digital world here, it's the same sort of thing. Uh, you want to pay to put uh, your message in front of the right people by paying you can target your message to the right audience on your terms because a lot of what the real world marketing is it's very scattershot I am going to put that billboard on Main Street where everyone walks by but it's not targeted enough a lot of people are gonna walk by but a lot of people are not gonna care I don't need a plumber today my pipes are fine but when they need a plumber I wish I had seen your, your sign. And with the digital version, you can target it to the right people at the right time and with the right mindset and such because this will tell you. Um, you're a restaurant company. Uh, let's uh, target your ad to people that show an interest in food, that they're foodies. They like to go out. They seem to tweet every Saturday night. They go out on date night. Uh, here's the people that would be most interested in your tweets. Not a guarantee. There's never any guarantee with marketing that you get the result even in the real world. That's why you know Coca-Cola spends billions of dollars every year to keep telling you, hey, we exist. Even though they've been around a hundred years, you still are inundated with Coca-Cola ads because there's also all of the other competition for every other beverage. So ads... Uh, We'll cover it again when we get to Facebook next week. But ads is a very valuable thing. I can show examples from real-world clients. Um, sometimes people want the most tangible evidence, which I can show. That is, you know, we, we've got a client. We do some uh, ads on some of the social networks. And the exact result is that in their cash register, they sold more of X item that week. Because it's more, that item has been promoted. It's in your mind. It's in their minds. They, they go off and buy it, and you see the result in sales. So in, in the course of this course of three months, we're not going to uh, ever, I'm not ever going to ask you to go in and create any, any account, any um, paid tweets or anything like that, but I'll just lead you to it that it would be valuable for you to think about doing at some point. Yes? So when you're paying for ad, uh, ad whatever, uh, like I see on Facebook it says uh, for three dollars we can reach 1200 people. Mm -hmm. So is it using your profile? Is it using your history? Is it using your followers? What is it using to decide which 1200 people are? And, and if you're new to the platform and you don't have a large following, mm. what is it using then to decide where to distribute your content? It's using, uh, um, it's, it's not using your information, it's using the information that you want. So if I don't have a large following, if I don't know who my followers are, uh, that's not a big deal because I can say I want to target these people. I want to target those that are interested in this topic or are in this region. That's good and bad in terms of, well, I don't even know where to start. Who am I going to target? It can try to suggest to you who to target. But again, if you don't have followers, if you don't have history, it's, it's a little harder. But that's the bad part. The good part is, again, uh, I can spend, like on Facebook, I can spend $2.00 and try to reach this audience that I think is my audience. It didn't quite work. It'll give me all of the stats, what worked, what didn't, and I'm out $2. And then I can try again. Okay, I'm going to spend $2 again. I'm going to try for this other audience. That one seems to hit a little better. My stats tell me that worked a little better. Okay, next time I'm going to spend $5.
So in the beginning, you don't quite know, perhaps, who the audience is. But as you test it with a little bit of investment, you will then be able to hone in on who is the right audience. And every dollar will then last longer. So then you get, you get screens with choices on, on topics and whatever. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't just go and look at your profile and make the decision by itself. Exactly. So most ad systems. Let you pick demographics, uh, location, age, income, keywords. They let you pick a demographic. Most ads systems let you pick demos, which then you can fine tune as you use them more, and the algorithm gets smarter to reach the right people easier. So the algorithm is the, is the internal system that determines success. Uh, so yeah, in the beginning, uh, perhaps you cast a wide net. And this, I'll, I'll cover it also in more detail on Facebook, because I think Facebook's one of the most effective ones. But in the beginning, you cast a wide net. I think I want to reach this audience. And then as you see your stats, it will then break down what is most effective for you most likely, and then you can target that audience even better. All right. Any other questions on this? On this? Um, on any of the topics I've talked about so far today? Any questions? Okay, we're going to sh uh, shift gears over to Google Plus. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about it in theory, then we'll get into it in practice, and then, as I said, uh, every network has similarities. Like we noted last time, I'll note them again today. They have similarities, and so therefore, as you get if as you get like samples or if you get samplers out of every network, they all kind of help you in in everything. Once you kind of get an idea of how Twitter works, it can help you a bit in Google Plus. Once you learn how Google Plus works, it can help you also get stronger in Twitter. Once you're stronger in those, it helps you in Facebook. So we're, we're going to do an overview and sample of everything. So the main topic for the day, um, Google Plus talking about here, this is Google's social network. Why Google Plus? From the point of view of the company, they needed a network to compete with Facebook. Facebook obviously is the big social network, everyone knows about it. It's a place where people connect with friends and family or even like business connections and all of that. Um, well, all of the social networks have basically that goal, connecting people. Uh, Facebook is the one that uh, seemed via luck or, or guile to become the biggest one of all, two billion users. Um, years ago then, like four, five years ago, Google realized, yeah, this Facebook thing is not a flash in the pan. They've already reached uh, 500 million users, or whatever it was years ago. So Google said, okay, well, Google.com, the search engine where people go to search for everything, Google.com has these millions of users or billions of traffic, whatever. But they were seeing Facebook is also getting a lot of traffic. And people are spending a lot of time on Facebook. And people are even searching for things in Facebook. I want to search for a cool new restaurant. I'm going to search for it in Facebook instead of Google.com. I'm going to uh, use Facebook as a search engine instead of Google. So Google said, we don't want that. We want people uh, to be on our networks, not the competition. The Google, uh, the Google site and the Facebook site are competitors. They're different companies. So Google say, we'll create our own social network. We will create our own website, our own app, where people can connect with friends and family, where they can search for things, where they can chat with each other, where they can play games, just like Facebook. So from the point of view of the Google company, that's the purpose of Google+. 
from the point of view of the person, from consumer's perspective, why not get on a, why not get my business on a network with a big reach for free. The, uh, the company that owns Google Plus, what, what company do you think that is? Google, which if you're really in the know, it's Alphabet. Alphabet. It, for a long time, the company was called Google, Google Incorporated, whatever. A few years ago, they changed their name to Alphabet. Not a lot of people know that unless you keep up with finance news and all of that. The parent company of Google Plus is Alphabet. We'll just call it very simply the Google company. Okay, the Google company. Um, what, uh, what, what else do they own? Google.com, which is search. Google Maps, which is locations. YouTube, which is video. Ways. They own Waze now, which is mapping. Or directions. They, they own this little website called Google Mail, also known as Gmail. Right, email. Probably half of you in here also have an Android phone. The Google company owns the operating system of your Android device. And on and on. The Google parent company has a hand in all of these fields. And then Google Plus, social network. So all of these properties from this parent company, Alphabet, a lot of reach. So why not put my business into a social network that has a lot of reach? When you get, when a person gets a brand new Android device, it has them create a free email account, a Gmail account. It then connects them with a free Google Maps account, and you get a free YouTube, and you get a free Google Plus. So all of these things are related to each other. And even though the company says it and has to say it, Google search results are unbiased. But even if they weren't, let's see the possibilities. What I'm saying here is, if I'm searching for Italian food restaurant, and I search at google.com, it's going to give me a bunch of results for Italian restaurants. And it might give me results for Facebook, or Twitter, or Google+. Now cynically, which one might be the one that is higher on the results? perhaps the Google Plus result. Even though the Google company will say all of our results are completely unbiased, you're going to get the best results when you search with us. Even if they're crossing their fingers about that, uh, doesn't it benefit, don't you think it benefits you a little bit if your company is also on Google Plus? Their preferred social network, their social network that they created, their network that's in the same business, I mean owned by the same business, um, the Google Plus result might appear higher than the Facebook result for the same business. Even if they don't, well, if I'm on Facebook and Google Plus and Twitter, well, there's more chance for my business to show up compared to my competitor. My competitor maybe is only on Facebook, but I'm on Google Plus and Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat, and so there's more possibility for my business to show up more times than my competitor, simply because I'm, I exist in more platforms. So we can say here, just in case, it may be useful to have a Google Plus account for your business to get ahead of the competition that isn't. Also, getting your business on Google Plus helps your search results 
in google.com. So again, being active on their preferred social network, the social network that they created, that's going to be helpful. If you're not on that network, I'm not saying that they're going to relegate you to page 10 of the results, but I'm saying every little bit helps with so much competition. I'm yet another Italian food restaurant. I'm yet another lawyer. I'm yet another realtor. I'm yet another daycare center. And so if I'm active, if I have an account at least and I'm active on more networks than my competitor, that could help me. So that's the big idea of why we might want to use Google+. Uh, you may not use it, you may not know people that use it, but internally behind the scenes, it could be very beneficial. When people search on Google Maps, my business appears on Google Maps because I've got a Google Plus account. There's a, there's a listing on Google Maps, a little pin for my business because I'm on Google Plus. Those listings there show up because of that. So if I want to be on the Google Maps, I might want to get on Google Plus, which gets me into that. And it's just another way to reach an audience. Uh, Google, uh, Facebook has the largest market share, but uh, we've probably seen the, uh, the news recently about all of the controversy with Facebook. And Facebook's been controversial since day one. But it seems like this year they've got in a lot of scrutiny and a lot of negativity. And uh, it's too early to tell, but you know, there's several think pieces coming out about, well, people are starting to turn their backs on Facebook. Some demographics are leaving. Younger people don't like Facebook anymore. They're on, they're on Snapchat or Instagram or elsewhere. And so it benefits you then to be on as many networks as possible to reach the right audience. So what we'll do is we will create an account if, if you don't have one. And then we're going to uh, take a break, and then we will see how, how it works, how we set it up. So I'm going to go over to the address plus.google.com, main Google Plus screen. I'm going to look at this. Um, we're going to go to this address, and what we'll say here, one email address can create and manage multiple accounts. So people right away ask, should I use my personal email or my business email? It's either or, but with one email, you can create multiple accounts. I can create a Google Plus account for me personally, or one for my business, or I can create different ones for different employees. Uh, they, they can all be created from one account. And we can also say multiple, multiple um, users can manage an, an account with their own login and password. So the real real world example, if a company hires us, uh, we're going to create their different profiles. I'm going to use my personal Gmail account to create the client's Google Plus account. But then I will grant access to the owner of the business to log into their own Google Plus account. So then now I have access to log in with my own login and password. And the business owner has access uh, to log in with her own password and email. So we each log in with our own credentials, and that's good security. What's bad is that if one email, one password, seven of us have it, and we all log in with that one email and password, that's bad security. Because one person, you know, the weakest link in a chain, uh, one person writes their password and leaves it on their monitor taped to it right there. Well, then one person is going to get us all hacked if they're doing that. This here, everyone can log in with their own usernames and such. And I'll show you how to do that in a moment. But let's take a look at that um, plus.google.com screen and then 
we'll see how it works after the break. The very first thing here, plus.google.com, you get sort of like a preview. You're going to see stuff. You're going to see um, latest sports headlines, news headlines, science, video games, whatever. And so, um, I see all of this content. Local content, global content, Google Plus. Uh, so Facebook was, was first, then uh, Twitter, then Google Plus. So it came out after the those other networks, and it sort of then got um, the ideas of of the various um, of the various other networks, and then took those concepts and, and improved upon them. We've got then join on the left or sign in on the right. If you've got a um, Gmail account, you'll be able to set this up very easily. If you don't have a Gmail account, you'll have to follow a few steps. So either click sign in or join. And uh, again, if you'd like to do this in class, you could. If you don't want to do it in our public computers here, you could wait and do it at home. Remember, you can just watch the video at your own pace and do this at home. Uh, but here it would ask for your existing Gmail account, or if you need to create a new one, you can go through the process of creating an, a new account. Uh, here again, it's going to ask you for the name, your name as a person, not as the business. We can set that up on, on the next step after that. You can then create a, a Gmail account or use an existing email address, set up a password. So I'm going to sign in with an account that I, that I have that already exists. And then after we sign in here, after I sign in, I'll show you what it looks like, how you use it. So what we'll do is we'll take our first break so you can have a chance to either sign in or sign up. After the break then I'll show you how the Google Plus account works and then of course how to use it effectively to reach your audience.